Welcome back, Smile Mentor family. It's another beautiful day, and we are covering today some of our uh, key all-on experts, a term that uh, I coined when I realized it's not just clinicians, but they are key all-on ex experts. So wanted to uh, introduce to you today Dr. Emilio Arguello. Um, I just love this guy. I mean, he he has uh, met him actually out in the Bahamas. I was out at a dental symposium for an implant brand. I uh, went to his lecture on um, the All On 4, All On X procedure and got to see him teach dentists from all around the world. And for us to connect on this project, he was gracious and invited us up to Colorado. Uh, we went and viewed his clinic. Um, talk to him at depth and and i'm telling you this this uh he has a lot of good stuff to share like even what is periodontal disease like there are so many cool things you're going to find out in this video that were nuggets that 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 uh didn't even expect like uh how does tobacco affect implant healing how does cannabis affect implant healing because they're there in colorado so some questions you're not going to want to miss Appreciate you guys following us on this. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thanks for following. If you haven't subscribed, please do. And any questions you have, we put it in the description below about the all um, the Smile Mentor and why we're doing this. Appreciate you guys and have a blessed day. Dr. Arguello, thank you for a second time of carving out time on an afternoon when I know how busy you are to really help um, educate not only our patients, but me and share some of your wisdom to uh, for 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 this documentary so thank you for that thank you matt it's uh, always a pleasure to being here i appreciate uh being here you invited me to be part of this project and also for your effort of coming over here to denver and driving the long distance to make it happen today so i appreciate it yeah you're, you're welcome and and for our viewers just so the reason we're here a second time is um, we, I had some audio difficulties last time. And so when we went to go to the post and, and look at the production side of things, we, we figured, you know, we wanted to do it right and not cut any corners. So, um, and, and when I figured some of that out, Dr. Arguello was willing to meet me at the practice again when I was in town last time at 5 a.m. in the morning. I haven't met many doctors that'll do that. so that helped motivate me to come back and, uh, right. and to do this. So I appreciate that willingness. It goes both ways. Um, <clears throat> okay, so talk to me, um, talk to me a little bit about your background, just so that, you know, I, I know I've gotten to hear it a little bit, um, but tell me a little bit about your background. Start with just you personally. Where are you from? What, uh, tell me a little who you are. Sure, I was born and raised in Mexico City. I did actually my dental school in Mexico City. But early in the game, I was involved with the sports. So I picked the sport of fencing. And I was, I've been doing that, or I was doing that for many years. And that helped me to meet other horizons and the world and international venues and things like that, because I did represented Mexico um, at the, all international competitions throughout the world. And uh, that inspired me to look at other opportunities in my life. So when I went back to Mexico and finished my dental school there, I had an opportunity to come to the United States and integrate myself to the team of research at Forsyth, at the Forsyth Institute back then, which is uh, affiliation with Harvard University. So then I did uh, many years of research in microbiology and periodontal disease mm -hmm. itself. And uh, that inspired me to continue on my journey into becoming a specialist. Uh, I was only a dentist and as a foreign trained dentist in a different country, you don't have the opportunity to practice dentistry here unless you go through a revalid re revalidation program here in the States. So I did that and uh, I finally finished my program many years ago. So when I moved to Denver, uh, looking for new opportunities and, 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 and family, uh, family ties as well, uh, I have settled here ever since. It's been 10 years since I've been here in Denver, uh, catering to our community. But uh, more than anything else, it's been a great experience because 
this journey and the clinical practice have shown me and taught me many, many things along the way, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with patients and, and actually getting to know patients at the personal level, becoming friends with them mm -hmm. at the personal level had uh, enriched my, my perspective of things mm -hmm. in life. <clears throat> Why dentistry? So before that, when you say you represented, so some of the homework I, I did on you, you, you represented uh, Mexico in the Olympics in fencing. Am I correct? Yeah, well, I was I was part of the fencing team, and and just for the viewers, uh, fencing is not a sport that is commonly known, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you get do it in college and so on and so forth. But the reality of it is a, a this a large group of people in the world that do it and is one of the first sports in the Olympic Games. So I had the opportunity to uh, to be part of, of, of the Olympic team and train the Olympic Center uh, oh, in Mexico for, for, for many years and, and, and move forward from there. That was many pounds ago. <laughs> <laughs> so why fencing? What got you into that? I mean, I, I'm just curious because you're right. It's not something that sure. I don't know too many people that, that are good at fencing. My son likes to play with a sword. But sure, sure, sure. Know, I mean, this it's a big deal. And so tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I I would like to say a very fantastic story that why methodically I have chosen fencing okay. as a sport. But the reality is, it was a girl. <laughs> it's yes. amazing what they do. <laughs> oh, you know, the story of our lives, right? Right. So the reality of it is that I was already training for different sports in the Olympic Center. And uh, a friend of mine, we were just interested in the girls that were good looking in the fencing hall. And the coach at the time that became my biggest mentor in my life, he acknowledged that we were there very often. And he said, well, you guys want to hit on the girls, might as well do the sport. So he pulled us up to do the sport and then just started doing it for fun. One thing led to another and then changed sports. So, so, so. Became, your, became your largest mentor. Yeah, what happens with this, I, I grew up, I'm, I'm a single, uh, I'm an only child of a single mother. Okay. Right. So I grew up in a, in in a working class in Mexico where um, I didn't have an structured family per se. When you grow in in in, in a lack of a structured family, many times you see uh, opportunities in your life that could deviate you from the pathway that you should be following. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Good or bad. Right. That is right. Sports certainly was my opportunity to shine to do certain things in the good mm -hmm. aspect of it but unfortunately my school suffered throughout those pro to, throughout that process so why and when when i entered the olympic center and uh, my mentor and my fencing coach um, we became very tight and he invested numerous times numerous, numerous hours and effort to train me uh, he also conditioned me to go back to school and he knew that i didn't have per se, a father figure in my life, uh, someone um, with the authority to mm -hmm. guide me into the right path. And I'm sure a lot of people identify with that. Mm -hmm. So along the process, he uh, was instrumental to get me into back to school. And that um, what he did is obviously he passed, he passed away now. I mean, he is no longer with us, but the teachings and the guidance that he gave me in a critical time in my life, which is perhaps as a teenager, mm -hmm. you know, when you're transitioning from an, an adolescence to a manhood, um, and there's a lot of different things that you don't know what pathway to take, he guided me to the right pathway, and his name was Enrique Cortez. Mm -hmm. So. I love I love hearing that, that, that when somebody's willing to invest the time and, and look at how he might not be with us any longer, but his legacy is, right? Indeed, indeed. So. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so <clears throat> why dentistry? What, what got you into that side of things? What made you go from, okay, so now he helped put you back on a path. You, you did well enough in school to be able to to qualify for dental school and then you what yes. was it a girl again that <laughs> brought you to dental you school? You may smile about it, my man, but it, it was and, and believe me, I didn't date too much. It was a girl. But it was a girl. <laughs> I feel embarrassed to say this in, on tape, man, but it, this is the first time I shared my life story on tape, right? In a naked public. So it's 
<laughs> audience, please excuse me for this, sharing this with you. But yes, the reality of it is that it was a neighbor, right? And um, I had a crush on her and, you know, I was young, obviously. And, and she was ahead in her uh, career and, and she had just entered into school and I was looking to see what I wanted to do with my life and between sports and between not knowing what to do and things like that. So she said, why don't you come over to see one of my classes, on one of my courses? You may be interested to see if you want to explore dentistry. And I did go, I did go obviously to have something positive that she could say, oh well, yeah, he came over, that's great. But the reality of it is like, I, I did go and, and then that developed into my, in, that caught my interest in, mm. I went a few times to some of her courses and then we never ended up dating or anything else. No, nor with the girls in fencing either, right? So we did not oh date it at all. We just <laughs> were flir flir flirtatious enough that yeah. we were one, were caught of interest, but ultimately we pursue the career path that that opened up at that time. So that what happened would be with the industry, and it got my interest. And you know, a more elaborate answer, I would say that dentistry is one of the professions that not only allow you to practice in a very similar manner, no matter where you are in the world, right? So everybody has very similar mm -hmm. problems. Also, it's a profession that can give you the opportunity to give back to people and to help them in their journey, right? Mm -hmm. It's a medical profession, but you're not a physician. You're still a dentist. And then if you specialize, then you specialize in one field of dentistry, though you can give different things to patients. Mm -hmm. you know? Perhaps that's a more elaborate story. <clears throat> well, and you talk about the global side of dentistry. You and I met in the Bahamas. We that's actually right. didn't meet in the US. We, you were, um, uh, I was invited to, to talk to a few doctors by MIS to go to their global symposium, the dental implant brand. And you were actually one of the professors there um, that I got to go and listen to your course on the All on X procedure. Right. And that really caught my attention because, you know, as, as a patient, I'm not clinical. I mean, I'm a business guy that is a sure. patient. And so, you know, I kind of laughed as I'm sitting in that lecture. Thank God I had a, a really good prosthodontist with me. He's a surgical prosthodontist that, that uh, actually did, it was the one who ended up doing my work. Uh, but, you know, I'm in there <clears throat> listening to that and I'm just, uh, it, was, it was quite humorous that I'm, here I am, and it was standing room only. I mean, you guys had the fullest course, I think, uh, for a breakout session of anybody there at the at the symposium. And so, but when I was listening to you, and 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 thank goodness, uh, Doctor Scanner was willing to decipher some of it for me. But I was listening, and you really knew not only the clinical side but the teaching side. Where you know you've done a lot of teaching, yes. Yes, indeed, actually. Ever since I finished uh, my specialty of periodontology, and I finished that back in Boston at Tufts University, uh, I had entered at that time the teaching core of faculty at the University at Tufts, and symbiotically, since Tufts and Harvard, my connection with Harvard was already established or pre-established, I started teaching in both universities at the same time. And that lasted for all my time that I was in Boston. After graduating, I spent uh, six more years in Boston in the teaching environment. Now today, actually, I still go back to the school. I still keep my appointment over at Harvard University for uh, as part of the core faculty with them. And uh, my specialty obviously now is a surgical specialty, is the treatment of periodontal diseases and the ability to re-establish the function and form through uh, surgical interventions. So I still do that um, every other week. Every other week I, I'm in the road back in Boston and until they decide they don't need me anymore. <laughs> every other week you're back in Boston? Yes, every other week I go back to Boston and I serve my, my time as a teacher, as a professor. Now, I have to say this, uh, m many people in, in our industry are great educators and I'm sure you have been exposed mm -hmm. to many of them that you have interviewed many of them and which I also admire. But uh, the reality of it is the education in this country 
in any capacity is not as well compensated from the financial financial perspective as it would be the clinical practice. So there's a lot of talent out there that is not in the education perspective. But I will perhaps will invite a lot of these colleagues that have the talent to share it back to the community because mm. it's an important thing to do for the newer generations. To mm. if you have a gift of knowledge, to give it back to the newer generations. Amen. You've definitely got a teacher's heart, and and I think that's a great point. That you know that's really who we've we've focused on is not just you know who has the biggest name in dentistry, but God's been gracious and brought us to some some high name people. But it's really those that have a heart to to teach. And and you teach on uh, on perio, is that is that what you'll that's you correct? Teach yeah. On? And, and they, so these are all post grad students that's that have gone through dental school. What are you seeing from current grads of dental school? What what do you are you seeing a shift or is there any difference um, of the type of of uh, dentists that are that are coming out or what maybe their heart is or anything like that from your perspective? Well, that's an interesting point because uh, I think, specifically to Harvard, for many years, the dental body or, or the people that have gone through the school have a flair between the education, academics, and research, right? And Harvard has made its name doing that. In today, I think, in general, in all dentistry and universities, uh, I think the dental school is, is facing a, a, a shift or a, or a challenge in the paradigm of what they have gone through for many years. And the reason why I say this is because there is a digital era of dentistry mm. that is invading our community for the better or for the worse. I mean, many clinicians say embrace that digital technology and many of them are afraid of it, right? Now, I, I do agree that the technology and the digital technology is very helpful in what we do, and we can benefit from that. However, I do think that dental schools face a challenge because it's a mix between uh, the traditional knowledge, what has been proven successful for many years, and challenging that dogma by embracing digital technology as a new wave of generations. And the problem with this is that nowadays clinicians and dental, and dental students, they go to online and the computer to look and learn for new trends of the, the technology. And they bring that to the professors and they ask them about it and the professors may get caught on, off guard trying to answer questions if they are not vested into that technology. So I think eventually there's gonna be a symbiotic relationship between the, the, the traditional and the digital technology, but I think is we are not there yet. And also in the exploration in the future, I think there are a lot of new materials that eventually will come out and make the, the final product for the patients better as well. Mm. <clears throat> so two-edged sword. It's got some good positives and some challenges that, that they're having to wade through and figure out. Correct. Um, okay, let's talk about um, what what is a periodontist? That's a good question. Uh, periodon periodontics is a specialty that is initially originated to target and treat periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is probably the number one disease in the oral environment in all of our communities throughout the world that leads to tooth loss. Mm -hmm. Not only to tooth loss, also leads to systemic complications. And there's a lot of research that correlates the oral with the systemic connection, right? Why does that, what does that mean for our, our general population? It means that because we have an infection in our gums, this infection goes to you through your entire system and could have a direct relationship with heart disease, pulmonary diseases, uh, Alzheimer's, and many other aspects that happens in our mm -hmm. body because there is an inflammatory disease as many others. Now, periodontal disease and periodontists treat that disease. The downside of this is that periodontitis, which is the gum disease or periodontal disease is a disease that to today 
after many, many years of research, we still have no cure for that right. disease. So the problem with this is that we need to treat it to try to slow down the progression of the disease. But at one point or another, we may end up facing the need of removing those teeth because there's not enough bone support because the disease is the bone away mm. around the teeth. So along with the practice of periodontology, there is a little bit of overlap with our colleagues in oral surgery because the periodontics and oral surgery are the only two surgical specialties of dentistry. Uh, we perform surgical interventions in our patients to deal with periodontal disease and try to regenerate bone whenever we can do it. And we also perform implant treatment, re bone regenerations, and everything else that is needed. So as our colleagues, the oral surgeons, but we don't focus so much in the uh, intervention of accidents or malformations or hospital interventions mm. and that, as our colleagues will do. Mm. So actually we do have a very good relationship many, in many cases and some of my best friends are oral surgeons because we, when we collaborate, instead of trying to overshadow to one another because we overlap in some of the procedures that we do, that collaboration has been very fruitful for us because we both benefit from either side of the story and they receive a lot of patients from us and we receive patients from them and we treat them as a multidisciplinary approach. <clears throat> so, so when I've heard some of the statistics about how much of the U.S. suffers, and, and there's a spectrum of periodontal disease, right? You've, it's, got, it's not just you have it or you don't, you can have varying degrees of it, correct? Correct, yes. And, and the percentage I heard of the U.S. that suffers from some degree, either on the minimum side up to very aggressive, was huge. Like, how much? I mean, you're going to probably know those statistics better than I do. Sure. It is calculated that some degrees of parental disease exist in the population between the 60 to 70 percent, depending upon where you see that population in the uh, highly populated areas or in the countryside. Now. The importance of this is that, you just said it correctly, there are different stages of the disease, right? The problem is we all have the same bacteria. Mm -hmm. And some people can, of the bodies of the host, cannot sometimes cope with that bacteria. So that means that that bacteria, in your case, it could be not causing any damage to your gums, and in other cases, in some of the patients, it could be very aggressive and causing damage to the bone under the gums. So the problem with that is that if you have a entry level, which is perhaps we call it gingivitis, right? Okay. That if it's not treated early in the game, it could continue to advance to the establishment form of periodontitis mm. or periodontal disease. So gingivitis, and we always, we, you hear that term in, in the, pa the patient population out there. I, I didn't know what that meant. I just knew it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the beginning stages of periodontal disease. It is disease. the beginning of stages. <clears throat> and the problem with the gingivitis is we can have it at any point in our lives. Right? We can have it as we were kids, uh, we're adults, younger adults, older adults. So people for many years thought that gum disease or periodontal disease was a disease from the elderly population. And the reality is it's not. Mm. It's, a, it's a disease that affects everybody. Uh, we have um, younger adults and actually even kids in the adolescence presenting with signs and symptoms of periodontal disease because it has been shown that there is a genetic component in many cases associated with this disease process. Mm. So because of that, is as disheartening as it is, Unfortunately, we have faced in the younger adult population, ages of 18, 20 and plus, that we end up removing the teeth, the entire teeth in certain patients because there is no longer a good amount of bone supporting those teeth and they need solutions. The problem is, and I'm going to make be critical on this particular point, because the point in here is that we sometimes think that implants, which is the next treatment sequence, mm -hmm. implants, when we replace the teeth, they will come to override and 
not even think that we have had periodontal disease in the past. The reality is the other one. We have the bacteria that is already there, that even if we have not did at all, this bacteria lives within the surfaces of your mouth, and we have done several studies proving that. And sure, you don't have a you don't have teeth, you have a denture. Well, there is no interruption or there is no port of entry between the outside environment and the inside part of the body, right? The moment you interrupt that or you create a portal of entry, mm -hmm. which is in this case placing an implant or multiple implants like it's all on X, yeah. uh, well, you break that interruption between the inside part of your body and then the outside environment. Right. So there's a portal of entry of that bacteria that will repopulate. So people think that, well, I had gum disease in the past and I lost my teeth because of this, but I'm gonna have implants and that is the end of it and I'm, I'm good, I'm cured, right? No, you're not. Because what the profession and sometimes is portrayed otherwise, Implants, unfortunately, do not last always forever. Right. We're hoping that they do, right. and we're shooting for that all the times. But the reality of it is that this bacteria could cause something that's called peri-implantitis. And if you were, and there's a lot of research on this topic, if you lost your teeth because gum disease or periodontal disease, chances are that at one point in your life through with the implants, you will develop peri-implantitis which is bone loss around your implant. And at one point we have to treat it again. Either we remove the implant and replace it, and we build the bone again, or we just do some in surgical interventions to try to minimize the bacteria around the implant, right? So if you have previous history of gum disease, you also have the same amount of risk of having peri-implantitis in the future. <clears throat> okay. And so, so then I guess my challenge on that, if we took a step back and you, you have periodontal disease and you're now at the stage to where you're, you have to make a decision that your teeth are failing, it is time to probably remove those teeth. Is there anything patients can do that will help? I know you said there's no cure, but can you do anything for it? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, sure. I mean, if, if I, if I'm, I'm 43 years old, if, if I had periodontal disease, which I'd be curious if I ever had that, that's part of, part of my challenge, but, um, diagnosing it, let's stop there. Diagnosing it. How do people know if they have periodontal disease? The dentist has to tell them, I'm sure does, but most dentists don't even talk about it. From what I've seen. That is correct. Unfortunately, I would say with in, in capital letters, unfortunately, the profession don't, doesn't always uh, cooperate with the diagnosing part of the disease process. So let me answer your questions. Yeah. Um, the very first question will be the diagnosis part of it. Yeah. How do we know that we have periodontal disease? Well, we don't know it. As a patient, we, right. you have no idea that we have it because it's a disease that doesn't hurt. Once in a while, you notice a little bit of bleeding while brushing your teeth, but it doesn't hurt, right? So literally, someone has to do a diagnostic test, and I'm not saying only just do a culture or things like that, as we are typically do for other diseases in the body. We have a clinical parameters that have been uh, established or pre-established by the American Academy of Periodontology and uh, organizations around the world, which is taking a measurement between your gum and your bone underneath. So introducing a ruler, it's called periodontal probe, in between the interface between your gum and your tooth and measure the distance between the gum and the bone. And there are certain parameters and thresholds that we're looking at and the bigger that space or the larger the space, the bigger the pocket, because we call them pockets, mm -hmm. the more periodontal disease you will have, right? But you have to be diagnosed with it. The second part of your question, what can patients do? Are they doomed because they have periodontal right? disease? <laughs> yeah. The reality of it is that in several studies that we have conducted at Forsyth, Harvard, and, and, and for many, many years with leading teams of research around the world, uh, we are still in diapers in knowing how to control the disease mm. efficiently. And from the patient's perspective, the only way that patients can help 
is a good oral hygiene and making sure that every time they eat something, they have certain level of hygiene to try to remove the pellicle of the bacteria that attaches to the teeth after eating something, whether you have implants or teeth, and the regular visits to your dental office so your dentist or your hygienist can clean your teeth and do a maintenance therapy where they sometimes have to get you numb in your mouth to be able to deep clean these areas of, of the gums. Other than that, if you tell me, is there a magic pill out there? Is there an antibiotic? Well, I have an infection. Why don't you give me an antibiotic? Well, the reality of it is the studies of the biofilm. This is the technical name to the bacteria in the mouth, biofilm, have shown that antibiotics are not as efficient or effective to killing the biofilm or killing bacteria because this biofilm is so complex that by the time the antibiotic start affecting the bacteria, the, this bacterial community in the core starts developing resistant mechanisms to that antibiotic. So it survives. Wow. Not only that, let's not think about the mouth. Let's think about the oil industry and the water industry, right? The biggest problem in those industries in terms of problems through the lines and everything else is biofilm formation within the lines. So bacteria forms within the water lines or oil lines, lines and with chemicals, they have to remove them mm -hmm. and it still comes back. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that bacteria in those pipes with heavy chemicals, it's still coming back, we're not putting heavy chem chemicals in our mouth. Mm. So it's probably gonna come back, come right? Back. Yeah, very yeah. quickly. Mm. So that's the biggest challenge. So the, <clears throat> the final answer to that question is the patient's oral hygiene, the mechanical removal of that bacteria on a regular basis, the continuous monitoring of that and cleaning at their office and maintenance is the key for success. Okay. Um. Man, this, this is opening up a whole new door. I didn't know we were going down this road, but this is <laughs> going to be so beneficial for patients out there because, um, because so, so let's start, let's start with after every meal. Now I, I, the reality of people having a toothbrush in their pocket that they're going to after every meal brush is pretty slim. Agree? Correct. One hundred percent. And That's so the what? Challenge. So what? You know, I, I remember talking to my hygienist, and she said chewing gum sometimes after a, sh a a sugarless solution gum can help with that and neutralize, I guess, some of that. Um, what? I don't know. I mean, help me out with sure. that. Or well, there are in the market, we have gums, we have uh, mouth rinses, we have toothpaste, and, and some of the components are on these local um, foods or local, um, I wouldn't say foods, local uh, adjuvants uh, have shown a, a slow decrease in certain levels of bacteria, like chewing gum. The gum, perhaps, if as long as xylitol and no sugar, um, the gum itself, chewing the gum, will have some physical properties to removing some of the bacteria in the surface of the teeth, at the, uh, just for the physical property of the gum. But it removes them from one place and places in a different place because it's not that you chew the gum and you throw it away right away after two or three chews. You continue to chew it for another 30 minutes or so, mm -hmm. right? So the, other, the second thing to that, mouth rinses, right? Mouth rinses, they do have some antimicrobial effect, but the mouth rinse doesn't penetrate deep into the gum area. It just penet only penetrates probably one or two millimeters inside the gum, where the bacteria is deeper into that gum area, is gonna perhaps slow down the progression of the bacteria above the gum, and then stop the feeding of that bacteria inside the gum, and maybe a little bit better stable, but I don't want to see it or present it as a cure. Mm -hmm. Same for the toothpaste and same for the toothbrush. There is a mechanical removal of the bacteria, but the bacteria they are removing is the bacteria above the gum. Even if you pick through the gum for as deep as you pick, and I don't recommend that, Right. <laughs> but um, the toothbrush or water pig or water flosser or any other brands and market that you want to call, they have a limitation in how deep does this go. 
into, into the gum. So in other words, I don't want to portray that these do not help. Absolutely, every single thing in the market that you can use and that you're using, go ahead and use it because every little one helps, but it's not a true treatment or cure for the disease process over the long run. So that's why it's so important to get in to see the hygienist. How often? How, I mean, really how often if, you, if you're if you brushing your teeth and like you said, you start seeing some of the signs like you're bleeding a little bit or some of that kind of stuff. A, I guess doing some research, which we'd have to do a whole nother segment on that, but doing some research on finding a good hygienist and clinic that will diagnose and help you identify it. But once you find that clinic and you go in, how often really should you, at least if you're at the beginning stages of periodontal disease, how often should you go to that hygienist? Well, that depends, <clears throat> as you said, in the stages of periodontal disease that you are. Right. If you are in the gingivitis stage, that means that you have inflammation of the gums, but you don't have or you haven't had any bone loss at that point, right? So it's just a little bit of swelling of the gums, some bleeding, and that is the first stages of this gum disease process. If you are in that category, if you do a, typically a six month protocol of visiting your hygienist or your dentist, I think that's more than enough. As long as you are a good compliant patient at home doing the oral care and what you're supposed to, if you do neglect, then up up when you visit to the dentist, so that way you can get more often to professionally mm. get them clean. Mm. When you are in the middle stages or the latest stages of periodontal disease, uh, we have a different categories of stage one, two, three, and four, right? And each stage is characterized by a certain degree of level of bone loss and other findings. If you are in any of those stages, and for the viewers, general population, if they go to the doctor or the hygienist, the dentist or the hygienist, the dentist starts doing, and or the hygienist starts probing around and mm -hmm. they come some numbers, two, mm -hmm. three, two, mm -hmm. two, three, two. And then they will call a number is five or four or six or seven. When they call in those numbers, they are measuring that space, right? Between the gum and the bone. So the deeper the number, the worse it is. So what that means for our patients, if you already have those higher numbers and you are in the category of periodontal disease establishment, then you get the first intervention as dictated by your clinician, it could be a, something called scaling and root planning, which is with instruments going inside the gum, your numb, and debride all that bacteria out of the inside part of the gum as much as you can. If you are in that category, the, how often can you, should you see your hygienist for maintenance? Every three months. Okay. Because a study <clears throat> shown that at three months, the bacteria gets back to the same levels with good maintenance at the same levels that they were prior to the initial therapy. Really? Now, the problem is not only doesn't stop there, right? Because you say, okay, I got my scaling and root planning, my deeper cleaning or therapeutic cleaning. I'm good, I'm safe, I just come every three months and happy-go-lucky. The reality is not. There has to be a reevaluation after minimum of six weeks after that time where the clinician, again, the dentist or the hygienist, or at this point, the periodontist, will intervene and say, if those probing depths or those pockets are still deep and you still have five millimeters or greater, then we have to do a surgical intervention to minimize those pockets and to remove the rest of the disease from the bone area inside the gums. So it is a surgical intervention. It's not very big surgery. Nevertheless, as an intervention that is required to minimize the bacteria. And regardless, if you have obtained clinical health levels because your pockets decrease to a maintainable levels of two and three millimeters of the depth of the pocket after the initial therapeutic cleaning, great, every three months, maintenance protocol. If your pockets did not decrease, then we as periodontists, we intervene and we help them decrease that, that, that pocket so you can have better access to keep it clean. And also every three months you have to come back and get your regular maintenance. What is the surgery? Tell me when you say the surgery, I know it's probably not pleasant, but still tell well, me what is it? Uh, the surgical intervention for parental disease, it entitles, uh, there are two ways of we treat it. Either 
by a resective method, which actually we resect the gum away from the pocket, so we minimize the distance between the pocket and the bone, or the gum line and the bone. And we do that by gently separating the gum from the tooth, getting access to the bacteria inside. The bacteria sits on top of the bone and it causes damage and holes in the bone. So our job is to clean up the bone very well. The bone will have some irregularities. Those irregularities get smooth down. Okay. And then when we finish, we put the gum back together, but we don't put it to where it was before. We intentionally push it away closer to the bone, right? Now, with this, the patient leaves the office with some stitches and the recovery time is just a couple of days, two, three days of swelling and it gets better. Now, once the stitches dissolve on their own, uh, the patient will have what we call gum recession, right? And the gum recession, unfortunately, not only if it's in the front, patients are not gonna like it. They say, well, doctor, my tooth looks longer. There is a little bit of a spacing between my teeth because my scalloping shape of the gum is no longer there, it's pushed mm -hmm. away. And that also exposed the root of the tooth, intentionally mm -hmm. exposed, right? Mm -hmm. And what that gives the patient is not only that, um, since that um, aesthetic concern is also a higher degree of sensitivity. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. And eventually it tapers down and goes away over time and there are some products in the market and some toothpastes that help with that. But that is one way of treating it. The second way of most common treatment and there are other alternative ways such as lasers and things like that that we also employ and they're also successful to some degree um, is regeneration. And regeneration means that if we think about this bacteria when inside the gum and ate some of the bone away, there's a hole right next to your tooth. Right. It's not a cavity in the tooth that you clean and fill. It's a hole in the tooth, in the gum area, right? So we open the gum, we gain access to that hole, we clean up the hole very well from the infection, and then we insert a bone substitute. This bone substitute in, in America, in 90% of the cases or more, it comes from a human source typically from a bone bank. And this, it comes in granules. And these granules are inserted into that hole. And then on top of these granules, we put a, what we call a barrier membrane, which is collagen that serves to protect the bone. And then we put some stitches in there. Oh. So we are not resecting the gum necessarily as in the first procedure that I described. We try to regenerate some of the bone that is lost around the teeth. But sometimes we combine a resective approach through a regeneration approach. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the anatomy of the bone loss that you have. Sometimes patients say, well, you know what, doc? My bone went away and I have big recession. What can you do? Can you build my bone back up? It's like, no, the bone doesn't grow as a brick wall around the tooth. The bone grows if you have a hole that is well contained. But if you don't have a hole, I cannot rebuild the bone around your teeth. Nobody can in the world. So that's why we are in this predicament. When we get bone loss very far down into the root of the tooth, we get to start, start extracting teeth and then start going to the route of implants. I mean, I, I am so grateful. I'm, you know, this journey has, has, you know, that I originally embarked on, you know, we had talked about it before because my mom kind of being my inspiration and now I've gone through it, but how much I've learned on this, you know, I mean, I've, I've spent years now around experts, but it's like, I mean, I thank you for sharing that. I mean, I, cause Absolutely. now it actually makes sense. So now those, <clears throat> those pockets that are around your teeth that, yeah, you hear them call out and poke and probe and you're always enjoying that piece of it. But it's an important piece of the diagnostic process. Those pockets, the deeper they are, the bigger party that you have for the bacteria. And the bacteria is the killer that goes in and will feed their party on the bone. Yes? Pretty much, that's right, yes. And your body, unfortunately, sometimes, genetically speaking, we don't have the ability to fight this fight bacteria naturally. Off. And if on top of that, you introduce other elements, like let's say our patients are diabetic, diabetic, mm -hmm. right? Diabetes, unfortunately, prevents the ability of the body to respond against bacteria invasion, right? Diabetes, say that again. So diabetes will, will prevent Would the body? Prevent 
or slow down the immune response of the body to fight an infection. So if you are diabetic and your diabetes is not controlled, right? If your A1C levels are very high and your doctor tells you, I'm sorry, your diabetes is not controlled. We want to hit the number of 7 or 7.5 and below that you're controlled. If you are out of control, what happens, your body creates a layer of thick collagen within your tissues. And if you have an infection in your body, regardless what the infection is, because the body created that thick collagen at the basal cell layer, and the inner layer of our tissues, uh, when the first responders of your body produces which is the macrophages, neutrophils, and all the technical names of these responders, your body generates that to fight infection, right? Well, imagine these cells trying to cross that very thick layer of collagen that has been created because the collagen has interlaced more densely. Mm. These cells will not get to the site of infection rapidly enough and the infection progresses more rapidly. That is the problem with uncontrolled diabetes. Mm. Now, if you have a periodontal infection, a gum infection, and you have uncontrolled diabetes, that actually makes it worse. In addition to that, if you smoke, for instance, smoking, what is the relationship between smoking and implants or smoking and gum disease, yeah. right? Yes. Well, smoking, what does the nicotine itself it reduces the oxygen tension in your body, right? And because the oxygen tension in your body is reduced, the, the cells um, uh, that are equipped to be able to function and have a metabolic process to fight the infection, they don't work as well because they are lack of oxygen, right? They are not work as efficiently otherwise. And that lack of efficiency, it makes the bacteria or the infections to expand more rapidly. That's why in diseases, uh, uh, many diseases that are inflammatory origin or bacterial origin, uh, smoking is one of the elements that we would like the patients to quit. Same for the healing response. Even if you don't have to find an infection, you place an implant today in a healthy patient, mm. you smoke, you have nicotine in your body, and that nicotine is going to have an effect on the healing response because your body is not going to be able to heal as well because of the lack of oxygen tension in your body, right? Now, what happens if I vape? Right. What happens if I chew nicotine gum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens if I have a patch? Right. Well, I don't smoke, I have a patch, right? Right. Boy, it's the same thing. It's the nicotine in your body. And that blows me away because you shared that. That's one of the things I learned about and learned from you on our first visit is that, you know, I, I don't want to speak for the world, but I think most people think that the smoking, for some reason, the actual smoking is what causes the problem. It's not the nicotine drug itself. And that, like you said, if I, okay, I'll just do a patch or I'll do gum and, and I'll be fine. But no, it's because the nicotine cuts off the oxygen in your body. In your supply. Right. And if you if you think wow. about this, obviously the cigarette smoking, uh, because the different types of smoking. Right, right. right. <laughs> we can talk about it. We are going to talk <laughs> about that in a minute. <laughs> well, the cigarette smoking uh, itself, there has other, compon other chemical components and combustion that happens at the local level, right, when you're smoking cigarettes. Nicotine is an effect in your body, but there's alkitran and other chemicals within the cigarette that actually has a direct effect in the mouth and the cell activity and inflammation and things like that in the mouth. So, yeah, I mean, smoking, if you think about having a, a smoking cessation that involves nicotine patches and other items, go ahead and do it because it's a way to get you out of the habit of the smoking, mm -hmm. right? And it still get you the nicotine in your body. So mm -hmm. eventually your body may not require the heavy loads of nicotine and eventually you don't have to wear the patches anymore. So right. it is a good intervention, but don't think that because you use patches or you use chew gum, nicotine gum, means that you are doing great and you don't have to do anything yeah. else. Yeah. You know? Use it as a tool to, to help you get with. rid of it. Mm -hmm. So then, okay. Um, and, and you know, this explanation 
really makes sense now as to why one of your special techniques um, that I have learned uh, throughout getting to know you and the research I've done on you is the is the maintenance portion of the all on X, the prosthesis and and that type of stuff. Um, walk, you know, I I uh, I was really on the fence about it, you know, because I kept thinking, okay, wait a second, I have uh, so my upper row, I've got a row of teeth that are that are uh, supported by six implants one pterygoid, four, five other. And now uh, if, if my thought process was in, in talking to the different people, don't remove it that often because you're messing with the screws and you're messing with, with the security of the prosthesis in the mouth. So, I mean, I wrestled with that, but when you, when you just told me about the periodontal disease and the fact that once you you get the teeth removed that it doesn't go away now it's going to affect those implants mm -hmm. by taking that out on the regular basis you're helping basically do the same thing that a scaling and that type of stuff am i am i close Matt, I'm so happy you asked, you asked that question because the reality of it and the sad reality of our profession is that not a lot of clinicians respect the fact that periodontal disease is a tangible disease that will affect their implants as we said before so you touch a very sensitive subject within our profession because uh, as you have heard from other clinicians well you go ahead and place the prosthesis on top of the implants and don't touch it for yep. a year don't touch it for two years just leave it alone exactly you, right yes i don't even want to see you yes pretty much right, right? but the reality of it is that you have just gotten delivered a new set of prosthesis or a new prosthesis that you have to learn how to clean, you have to learn how to use, uh, you, you're gonna go through adaptation processes from your muscle, from your phonetics and the way you talk and everything else, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Now, but you also have to go through the adaptation process of being able to clean and prof be proficient in cleaning that prosthesis. It's hard. It is very hard because in the Olonex, we have two main events. The first event that happens when you remove the teeth or you already have no teeth at all, you have a denture. That first stage of first event is when you have your four, five or six implants placed throughout the arch. And the same day you get a new prosthesis, like a bridge across all together, bonded together. But we typically, in some occasions, we don't have to open the gum, but in many occasions we do open the gum and we have certain level of reduction of your bone and making sure that it's nice and smooth and we place our implants. But once you are in the healing process in the first four or six months that the implants have to integrate to your body, um, you're just learning how to use this prosthesis. You're just learning how to clean it. So if I just let you go, with no maintenance in those first three or six months, um, most likely you're gonna have accumulation of impaction of bacteria in, in that area and in the critical stages where the implants are healing, right? And if you are a patient that lost the teeth because of periodontal disease or gum disease, yeah. that bacteria could cause early damage to the interface between the implant and the bone and the gum. Right, because you're not as efficient in cleaning this this prosthesis. So it's so it's going to actually go against the osseo integration process. It could. Now, granted that there are some studies in the literature outlining this, and there are plenty of studies outlining the progression of periodontal disease around the implants, of mm -hmm. course, and the full impaction. Um, but I cannot tell you exactly that this is 100% is gonna happen in every patient. Sure, right? but it's a, it's a, prob it's it's a, a probability. probability. Yes. Right? And the moment that in medicine there is a possibility, you have, I think, the responsibility as a patient and as a clinician to take the necessary steps to mitigate that possibility, outlining, outlining the risk to benefits of that procedure, right? In this case, is there a risk of me seeing you in a monthly basis uh, from the moment that you go the temporary prosthesis in your mouth until your implants have completely healed before the second event, which is the final bridge on top of your implants. Mm -hmm. 
is there a risk on that? Is there a risk on the implant? No, no, there's no risk on the implant. Actually, there is only a beneficial environments. First of all, imagine the first month, you barely could brush your teeth because you have stitches in your mouth, right? Right. right. And the food gets in there because you still have to eat, right? Mm -hmm. And then you rinse and then you just do a water jet in, into that area and so on and so forth. You're doing what you can. But the reality of it is there's still some remnants of food in there, right? What we see in, I would say, almost every patient, and we do a lot of them in the daily basis. Mm -hmm, you sure do. Um, we remove the prosthesis in the first month and we see the food completely impacted in the interface between the gum and the implant or the attachments and underneath the bridge. You never had a bridge before. You don't know how to clean it. You are trying. I taught you how to do it. You're doing your best. You are sensitive because you're just healing from the surgery. I need to remove it to clean it. And don't forget, technically speaking, we don't want to put pressure on the implants in the left or the right part of it because it's a screw, right? We want right. to put pressure in the time that the implant is healing. But don't forget, for our clinicians, our audience, uh, this system, the Olonex system, is a system that has three main components in the temporary phase. It has the implant, which is the screw that goes in the bone. It has another attachment on top of that, which is an abutment. That's what it's called. And the abutment actually screws into the main body of the implant. But on top of that abutment, that attachment, is where the prosthesis of the bridge is going to sit on top of that. Right. And that has a mini screw. It looks like the eyeglasses screw, yeah. this tiny one, mm -hmm. right? It goes inside. And that screw in the temporary phases is not torque. So actually it's just tightened, typically by hand. And that's tightened because we have the ability to put the force or the torquing force or the unscrewing force when you ha have you come back for that maintenance appointment. So we can easily remove your prosthesis clean it by putting back that prosthesis on top of that abutment without making or putting force on the body of the implant that is healing inside the bone. We're so just putting force going... on top of the abutment. Mm. So that is why to dissipate any doubts, that's the reason why we do it. And clinicians sometimes are not comfortable doing it because they feel that they're gonna unscrew the implant every time they unscrew the prosthesis. Right. Right. And that's and, and I've I've had this argument mm -hmm. and that I've had I've had some clinicians I know very well say my you, you can't do that you're going to you're going to you're going to risk the integration part process because you're torquing it but you're saying because the screw is not torqued to a high level and it's in the abutment it will it will not it will not torque or... You're not going to move the implant. You have what we call a cross arch stabilization all throughout the implants in a well single, one single piece of prosthesis all held together by these little screws and the screws are hand tightened to that abutment that when you look at the torque that the implant receives from that attachment or component which is the abutment that attachment to the implant, to the body of the implant is inside the bone. To, to give you an example, is somewhere about the 35 Newton centimeter force mm -hmm. of torque, right? Mm -hmm. Or above. Uh, the amount of force of torque that you put by hand tightening that mini screw into that abutment is about five to eight, maybe 10 maximum. So you don't wanna have a transfer torque to the implant and we have Come, we come in from the perspective of a periodontal perspective or bacteria perspective that affects the implants, right? And that is perhaps the difference. I have a different view on this because of that food impaction, that bacteria impaction and yeah. the predisposition for the patient for peri-implantitis, right? And we be also, from the clinical experience of doing this more of that 10 years of experience doing this not only one patient a month, not only one patient a year. Yeah, you do a lot. We do in a daily basis. And in daily basis, having this protocol, we have, and I'm sure our colleagues have had also high, grade, high rates of success because this all on next procedure is very successful. 
but we just want to mitigate that extra possibility of bacteria around the implants whenever we can. Now, in the second event, when you have the final bridge put on, and mm -hmm. the second part of the uh, answer to the first question, if you previously, when you had teeth, you have gum disease and you used to come to the dentist, every three months for regular cleanings and maintenance, mm -hmm. we also recommend the same protocol. Now, if you are super efficient and you are very diligent about cleaning your prosthesis and the interface of your prosthesis and the gum, then you can just do it three times a year. And yes, unfortunately, the clinician, either the uh, where you do it with the, your, your general dentist, where you do this maintenance with your surgeon or with your prosthodontist, or restorative dentist, or hygienist in that matter, they will remove the prosthesis, they'll clean it up, they polish that, and they put it back in there. And once a year, you have to replace those mini screws because the, the thread gets deformed. But overall, there is a charge for that as well. Sure. And, and patients sometimes don't understand that, unfortunately. And, and it's a charge because there's a physical effort of doing all this. And uh, we have to keep the lights on, right? And we have to pay mm -hmm. the salaries and mm -hmm. things like that. And mm -hmm. we're not making any money out of this mm -hmm. maintenance process, but it's, uh, we find that as a necessity. And is that probably one of the biggest pushbacks you get from your patients is, you know, there's extra cost and all that kind of stuff for the screws and uh, I got to keep coming back. I mean, does that, does that, what is your response from most patients? Let's well, I think everything starts with the first patient interview that we have previously talked in the past about the patient interview, how, what the patient expects in the first appointment where they come and they have no knowledge about this procedure. Yeah. And everything comes from that first appointment because we are very transparent with the patients and say that there's, there is a cost of treatment on the market cost on this treatment. But once you go through this treatment and you have to understand that there is a maintenance phase associated with this, as it will be buying a new car, even if it's new or old car, doesn't matter. You still have to do the old change. You right. still have to do the maintenance. You want to keep the engine running. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with this. It's a maintenance protocol. Mm -hmm. And maybe every five years, depending on the type of prosthesis that you have gotten or have chosen to do, then you could go ahead and uh, replace that prosthesis or the outside layer of that prosthesis because see, it is wear and tear, right? The, mini, the little screws may have to be replaced once a year, come every three months, four months, or every, every six months, depending upon your ability to take care of this prosthesis. Mm. And then we are very transparent from the very beginning. That's great. You know, that's going to segue us and, and, and shoot, I don't, I don't want this to turn into a five hour interview. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to get us back on track, but I mean, I, I'm, it makes sense now why, you know, you were gracious enough when we talked on the phone about trying to schedule this second interview where I said, you know, can I, can I get a list of some patients that, um, that had had their work done at Altura? Um, uh, the practice which you you practice at, you and your associates, and can <clears throat> can I get some that have had a final delivery or or in almost to get their final delivery stage? And so, man, another brag on you guys. I mean, shoot, that was Friday night at like six o'clock, and and your team hustled and got that. I had a list by Saturday. To be able to, I mean, that's impressive. So good job on your team, by the way. Thank but, you. But I called and I talked to some of them and that's where they were saying that, that every month they would come in and have the prosthesis cleaned. And I thought, really? I've never heard of that. And I've interviewed a lot of clinicians and sure. I've never heard of that. But you're saying because that healing process, when you're in that, that you are, it is so critical you're in the osseo integration process that that you have the 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 gum level the connections everything is well cleaned and well maintained during that healing process do you have many patients that continue to come to you on a once a month basis after they get well um the first month is the critical time after the after the initial surgical appointment and that first visit at, at one month is very important because that is when they are learning how to clean it, right? And mm. then we spend enough time, our team spend enough time with them 
teaching them how to clean these prostheses. And we clean them ourselves and we polish, we adjust the bite and everything else, whatever new adjustments need to be done because right. they're also learning how to function and how to bite with those teeth, right? So I send them home with biting nicely and then they come back and they bite crooked. Yeah. He said, what happened? Well, the muscle is getting adapted, right? So I have to make some adjustments in there. So that first visit is critical. From there on, if they are proficient, uh, we schedule another month. And there is a point in time that their patients become very proficient about their hy the hygiene and they understand what they have in the mouth. At that point in time, we release them and say, okay, first two or three visits every month, it's okay. You're doing a great job. I'm not getting a lot of uh, impaction of food. Mm. Let's release you back until your six months appointment, right? Mm. Or formal appointment, right? And some patients, unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, you know what? Hey, doc, I try. Uh, I have a lack of dexterity. Uh, I cannot put my toothbrush very well in there. I use electric brush. I will have a water jet, every, everything else, and I still cannot get it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, those patients need more. Absolutely. Hand by hand, right? Hand in hand uh, help. So those are the patients that we monitor. If you never seen the patient for six months after you did the procedure, how do you know the patient is doing a good job or, or not doing a good job? It's a great point. Right? It's a great so, point. And, and same thing for dentistry in general, right? Dentistry in general, you know, if you have a lot of cavities in your mouth and then you get them fixed and the doctor tells you, okay, I'm going to have you come back in the open basis to check on you to see if you're not having more cavities or give you the green lights that come and yeah. see me in a year. Yeah, yeah. So. so what do you do if you're a patient and you go to one of these clinicians that that are, like I said, you, this is a touchy subject because there are some clinicians out there that say, no, don't ever take it off, don't don't remove it. So they sit in the chair, they're, they're interviewing the clinician. Um, by the way, guys, that's a great question. Ask them, how, what is the maintenance look like um, during the healing stage, how, you know, what, are, what is that first month appointment? Will they remove it? Will they, um, but, but if they ask a doctor and the doctor says, and he makes an argument, oh, you never want to take out the prosthesis and he tries to, but they feel convinced after watching you and hearing this, that it is a good move to have that out. Should they just go somewhere else or should they tell the dentist that, hey, no, I want to come back and do this? Or what would be your recommendation to that patient? I think you touched on a very important point, which is the trust and confidence of the communication or the portal of communication between the patient and the clinician. Mm. If the patient is comfortable to ask in the clinician or if the clinician is the one that dictates the treatment and they doesn't give the opportunity to the patient mm. to ask questions, then that is the point when I say, maybe it's not a good fit. If a clinician yeah. doesn't spend enough time with you to be able to answer your questions, and you're gonna go through this expensive procedure, yet also life-changing event, uh, you deserve to ask your question, ask That's your right. question and get your questions answered. Now, the fact that we do remove the prosthesis, again, I wanna make sure that the point is well taken as we come from a periodontal gum infection perspective and point of view. I don't want to discredit my colleagues or my cl other clinicians because they do not do it, right? For us, it's only a recommendation of our observance and of knowledge in science, scientific approaches sure. and things like that, right? But they have, there have been numerous, and this procedure is performed in a daily basis all throughout the countries in hundreds and hundreds of cases every day. And this, success, this, this treatment is still very successful. Yeah. So yet, I'm not saying that because I recommend the removal of that prosthesis and the maintenance of that, that if your clinician doesn't do it, it means that it's gonna fail. No, it probably not gonna fail. I mean, if not, we will have critical numbers of failures yeah, you're right. in the country. So for us, it's only our recommendation. It's a good idea for you to have this conversation with your clinician if you already have and uh, depart from the understanding of how gum disease could occur around implants yeah. and see what your clinician, clinician has to say. It doesn't mean that he's a blast, he or she is a bad clinician because doesn't take it out. It's just a different approach, right? But at one point in time, it should be taken out. Yeah. Whether it's a one month or one year or six months, whatever that's taken out or at a time of conversion, at one point in time, you do need to have a maintenance appointment along mm. the lines, right? That's a great so point. just have a communication with your clinician. 
Okay, I don't need to bang that drum anymore, but thank you. Um, you know, let's let's talk about. I would love to hear from your point of view, Dr. Arguello. What uh, what are some of the key questions a patient can a should ask um, should ask when they are in the chair doing the interview? Because we've talked about this before, that that the patient is hiring the doctor the dentist, the specialist, Correct. we are the ones hiring the specialist. So we have the right to interview and ask who we're going to, because this is, this is a big deal. This is a life changing event. I'm glad you said that earlier. So what would be some of those questions during the interview of the clinician side that you would recommend a patient should ask? I think the very first thing that patients should think about, it will be, uh, to look at the credentials of the of the of the clinician they're about mm -hmm. to see, right? Mm -hmm. Do a, a you don't have to be an extensive search, but you want to know where the clinician got trained, what is the qualifications. Now let me make a pause in here because the qualifications of the clinicians, this treatment is broadly offered by the profession in general. It could be a general dentist, it could be a surgical prosthodontist, it could be an oral surgeon, it could be a periodontist doing this procedure. And we have a very talented clinicians in all aspects, whether it's a general dentist, whether it's a prosthodontist, or any other member of the staff. Many people that perform these procedures are very highly qualified to do this. So okay. in our country, in America, we do not have a isolation of who can perform this procedure. I'm a specialist and I'm specialized in surgery and I deliver, as, uh, along with my colleagues, the oral surgeons deliver a surgical intervention for our patients. But this is not exclusive to us. This is not exclusive to any particular group of our profession. It's open to everybody. And as such, we had the opportunity to train clinicians in some of the education centers uh, clinicians as general dentists, prosthodontists to train them in the surgical modality for them to be able to be proficient. So I think the initial question that you have to ask the dentist is, doctor, how comfortable are you to perform or performing this procedure? And have you done that many times in many patients? Clinicians are not necessarily always ready to answer that question. So is a question that will catch the clinician off guard. Mm. And what when you, like this interview is not, we scripted. don't have any script or nope. anything else, right? Nope. <laughs> you are thinking the questions and I'm answering as you're coming shooting the questions, That's right? That's it, yeah. So, but as clinicians, we're not actors. And I think I mentioned this to you in the past. Yeah. We are not trained to perform on there for the camera. You know, this is a candid interview. Yeah. The interview from the patient to clinician is also a candid interview, right? Mm. We are not trained to perform. And if we are a very good con artist and perform, we should not be in this profession. We should be in the, you know, doing something else, right? Right, right. The reality of it is when you target the clinician with these questions that catch them off guard, yet they are important, and you open that portal of communication, then the clinician should be ready to tell you, rest assured that I have done X number of cases, so I do it very often, or I got, I was trained in this facility, I was trained under this person. And you may not know the name of the person or the facilities where they were training. Perhaps it's irrelevant at that point. But the reality of it, that if the doctor, you catch that doctor off guard, and he doesn't give you an immediate answer and has to research in the back of their mind, what is it that they mm. have to tell you? Mm -hmm. Well, Perhaps at that point, you have to continue to ask a line of questioning based, based on the experience of that clinician. Mm -hmm. Now, whereas the other questions that you should be asking is, what is your protocol to perform this procedure? And say, so, well, you know what? I got time right now. We can do it, in, we can do it right now, you know? <laughs> the reality of it is that <laughs> there are procedures that can be capitalized for the urgency of the procedure that we can do immediately. Fine, but this is not one of those, mm. right? This is a procedure that involves planning. And the planning starts from the clinician being able to capture the jaw relationship with some model work, uh, to be able to capture some radiographic markings, 
perhaps if possible, a three-dimensional scan of your, of, your, of your bones. And through this planning process, and I'm not talking about digital planning, it's just actual planning that has to be done and coordinate with our technician, coordinate with the, the team of clinicians that are gonna be treating you. So typically, it's not a, in a process that, need to, that could happen tomorrow all the time. In selective cases, it could, because all of a sudden you're wearing a denture, you have all the relationships checked, and you're ready. Yeah, we can go ahead and do it. But that is another aspect. Now, if you have undergone already some medical treatment for X or Y and C of your body, because you're treating a systemic condition or a blood pressure or things like that, and nobody in the team asks about your medical conditions or your mm. health history, that probably is gonna be the first red flag that I will see. So you have to make sure that the team or the clinician or whoever is gonna treat you have access and have reviewed your health history. And if you have heart disease, blood pressure, diabetes, and any other systemic condition that you may have, then make sure that you discuss that with them. Because in many cases, we can mitigate some of the risks by addressing those medical concerns ahead of time. Mm. And, and you just brought up a great point. It's not always the questions that the patient asks of the clinician, it's what questions they ask of you. Are they, are they attentive to you as a person, not as a procedure? Correct. And that is so important that I think um, not all clinicians We'll, we'll do that. And so, you know, I think that's that treating the person, not just the procedure, is an important piece of this. But you also segue into another important part of it, right? Which is what is your main concern as a patient? I have to be able to listen what is what you're telling telling me. And I'm gonna ask you, why are you here? How can I help you? Or what is your main concern of coming here? And you will tell me perhaps I am concern about my social interaction because I have no teeth. I'm concerned because I cannot chew my food. I'm concerned because I cannot taste my food with my dentures or my dentures move or I'm embarrassed or just I cannot function, or I cannot smile, etc., etc., etc. The treatment and the best treatment modality for you when you're asking those questions and when you are telling me that story of what, does you, what are your concerns, I have to be able to translate that in my mind and tailor the treatment, whatever the treatment will be, if it's an all next mm. or if it's a implant supported over denture or all the, all the modalities of treatment, I have to tailor that to you. So it's not one size fits all or one size fits most. Mm. It is, I need to tailor it to what your expectations are. Excellent. You may, you may be, you may tell me, you know what, doctor? Um, I'm in a fixed income and I cannot achieve this process right now. And I'm sorry, but this is too expensive for me at the moment, which is the question that most of our uh, audience may have, right? The reality is we as clinicians can help you to achieve the final goal of having this procedure, but we may have to start in building blocks. Perhaps the first block is gonna be to place few implants in your mouth or fewer implants in your mouth at a lower cost and perhaps deliver a implant retained denture, something that is snap-on denture, right? Mm -hmm. And perhaps that is the way that you're gonna be for the next two or three years until you are able financially to afford the next step. Or perhaps that is not what you wanted. You say, you know what, doctor? I, I cannot move my hand. I'm, I'm impaired in my dexterity. And dexterity impairment means that I cannot potentially clean thy prosthesis, right? In that case, I may not offer you an all-on-X. I may tell you, you know what, you perhaps should consider to have a denture on top of your implant that snaps off the implants, where you can easily clean it outside, rinse around and clean around it and put it back on, right? Mm -hmm. So all-on-X is a great therapy, but the clinician should be able to listen to the patients. It's not what I perceive as an ideal treatment for you, is what can meet your expectations of where you are at the moment. So good and so excellent. I'm so glad you brought that up. And and in and uh, for those out there that are going to be looking at possibly the snap on, that is something I've I've, I've researched and talked to some. Um, if you're going to have a doctor do that, 
make sure that the implants they place are convertible uh, down the road and that they can plan, right? That they need to plan that that's part of the game plan of saying, hey, let's say I live all my life with this, great, that's fine, but let's say I do wanna move five years down the road, my financial situation, or I want something fixed, that can these be converted to that, I think is an important question to ask. Yeah, I think that uh, we call it a transition strategy, mm. right? And that transition strategy means that we depart with the final goal in mind and we, the clinicians, will place those implants in the correct positions so they can be utilized in the future for the final goal. And we also place the correct components and implant systems that are versatile enough to be able to get the new attachments adapted in the future so you don't have to double expend the money. Right, right. Um, any other questions you can think of that you would like our audience to be empowered with for their uh, appointment? I know there's a bunch that we're not gonna cover, so don't feel, sure. but but is there anything that you think we ha that, that we haven't covered uh, before I move to my last couple questions? I think uh, just the empathy that the clinician always shows to the patients today, in today's day and age, unfortunately, we have moved away from the quick doctor's visits that sometimes we go to our mm. annual check, the can, doctor comes for one minute and tells you, you're doing okay, we'll give you blood tests and I'll tell you about it. And you get an email from me, right? And the doctor didn't care about whether or not, you know, you have pain in your leg that you came for, but right. they just dismissed you, right? Mm -hmm. We have come into a reality of that the empathy between the clinician and the patient is not always there. Unfortunately, we are all busy doing what we do best, right? And we cannot spend an hour with the patients all the time, but enough that you are able to have that portal of communication. I think that's the very minimum that we, the clinicians, can do for our patients to open ourselves up, to have at least that question and answer session, mm -hmm. to be able to explore that. It may take five minutes, it may take 10 or 15 minutes, but that's at least what we, what we see. Other than that, the rest of that, you can open the door for many other questions. Yeah, right, right, but that's an that, important but, Yeah, piece. I think that's important. Um, you practice in Denver area, Denver suburb of Colorado, yes? Correct. And Colorado was also one of the states that first legalized cannabis for recreational use, mm. correct? That's correct, yes. You talked about the smoking part when it came to nicotine. Um, if, if a patient is out there and they smoke cannabis, um, a, does, does that, does that, we talked so much about periodontal disease. We didn't cover this the first time. Does, does that, does it hurt, help, or doesn't matter when it comes to periodontal disease if you're smoking cannabis? A uh, very good question because that's why when we talked about smoking, mm -hmm. I made a differentiation of smoking cigarette, cigarette right. smoking, right? right? Excuse me. So what happens with cannabis? is the consumption, the consumption of cannabis whether, cannabis, whether it is through smoking or ingestion or candies or, or edibles or things like that, uh, the audience have to understand that there are two main ele elements of cannabis, which is the THC mm -hmm. and the CBD. Mm -hmm. THC in some strains of the plant, and some plants have a high strength of THC, it's the component of the cannabis that makes you high. Right. That keeps you comfortable, keeps you calm, keeps you good, you know, f feeling good, right? right? And I never tried, believe me. But anyhow, uh, I have a lot of patients and friends that do, right? Yeah. So that strain is the one that actually doesn't have any benefits to your health. Okay. okay? So does it hurt? Uh, well, that is controversial, and I perhaps <laughs> I shouldn't uh, di dive into that because okay. I have my thought process. Because, you know, it depends of what type of disorder you're treating. If you're treating um, behavioral disorder that the THC is able to keep the patients calm and down versus uh, getting into a deeper medication, some medications that affect mm -hmm. their, their brain in different ways, mm -hmm. well, that's great. The THC has a great advantage, right? Yeah. But for our clinical part of it, for what we do, THC has not demonstrated to have a beneficial aspect. Okay. CBD, in contrast, the other component of the cannabis is CBD has um, widely, been widely researched and the reason why initially 
it was approved as a medical treatment, cannabis was, because of the CBD content. And there are certain strains of the CBD that you could use to minimize inflammation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the CBD is the, the number one uh, component of cannabis that has been studied the most for the me medical profession. Now, for our patients that smoke cannabis, mm -hmm. for instance, what I would tell them, or what I typically tell them is like, please abstain yourself from smoking within the first two or three weeks after the procedure, because this is the critical time where you have a lot of inflammation in your mouth and things like that. And the thermal exchange from the smoking of the cannabis, it may just lead to more um, heat and more inflammation and mm. so on and so forth. So we don't want to do that. We have controlled that. So I don't prevent them from taking them. Okay. I don't tell them to stop. But I suggest and recommend is that if you're going to acquire some cannabis, ask your dispensary and see if you can perhaps start using a strain that is higher in CBD, maybe an oil, maybe an edible, and maybe just ingest those in that manner because that probably is going to help us in our journey to minimize inflammation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that is probably my take on, on, on cannabis at the moment. The, the reason I asked it in the original interview, and, and just to clarify, you know, is because I, I, when I had my procedure done, I had access to a, a device called the electrical equoscope that helped with inflammation. But also, I am not a big fan of opioids. I know that there's a time and a place and that type of stuff. And so I don't want to beat anybody up on that topic, but I, I prefer to not, um, unless I absolutely have to. And I know that this is a highly, can be a highly invasive procedure. So it'd be okay if somebody did. And I think it's okay if doctors prescribe it and I don't want to get on that, but I chose personally to try to use CBD and this device to minimize and aid with the healing process. And I never had to take a pain pill one. And it really helped a lot. Yes. I think when you think about uh, surgical interventions, mm -hmm. the reason why people have experienced most pain or more pain is because the inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. The higher the amount of swelling or inflammation, the higher the amount of pain that you will, you will experience. That is actually quantified and known, very well known by the profession. Right. Now, there's another component that you touch base on in this particular question, and you're not going to spend too much on that, but it's the use of narcotics for pain control. A lot of patients do need that, right? And we're not against that, actually. If patients need it, you know, we can make sure that keep you comfortable. Sure. The reality of it is that if the patient is using a content of THC in the cannabis, because it makes them more relaxed and they impair some receptor sites in the brain that interpret the pain as pain. In other words, in a layman's term, if you're high and that helps you cope with the pain, as long as you are, it doesn't impair your ability to work or you're not using it into the work environment and things like that, if it works for you, it's okay. Right. And the reason why I say this is because even though I don't want to go through the controversy and the scientific elements of this, uh, there is a tangible benefit on those things, right? Yeah. And based on scientific elements, we also know that it doesn't have the same potential for addiction that it will be another level of or higher level of narcotic mm -hmm. right yeah so i perhaps don't want to say i encourage people to do it but i will say if you're already doing it and that helps you to cope with this for sure and if you have a cbd and the thc in addition to that helps you to cope better okay i'm not against it yeah perfect and and i appreciate your candor on this i know it's a touchy subject and the fact sure. you know most people wouldn't even answer it so thank you for for touching that um uh, what, what would you say has, um, been the biggest life change? Cause you guys, you guys hold a lot of power and you guys are, you know, the good ones. And, and I really, I have not, I have not, and you'll be able to see these videos. I've not, I'm not vouched for a lot of the clinicians on this, but my gut and everything I've seen, Dr. Arguello, you are one of the good ones. And so um, the good ones, uh, um, the change you can have on someone's life, and I can speak 
from my family's perspective, my perspective is huge. It changes, you know, I, I can speak with confidence when I go do all my CE courses and I do that kind of stuff. I can, I go in for a business interview or um, just even at the family dining room table, I can laugh without sure. worrying about something show. So, you know, I, I have experienced the life change, but I've never experienced it through your eyes. I've never been able to help that change for someone else. Sure. And so can you tell me off the top of your head, what's the what's one of the most memorable, it doesn't have to be the biggest, but what's one of the most memorable life change stories you've been able to see when, especially on the All sure. on X? I know you've done some other, you do a lot of other procedures, but when it comes to the All on X, can you share that with me? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because we, as I mentioned before, we're sensitive to the patient's needs and wants, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we try to insert our own agenda where we think is best for that patient and is not necessarily the best for that patient. One of the elements that our audience and patients have is the perception of the quality of life. And quality of life perception, it differs from patient to patient. Sure. Um, to answer your question, a story that comes to mind and a very touchy story is that uh, we have a patient by name, the, name, the name Helen in our clinic. And this happened already some years ago. When she came to the clinic, she said, doctor, I'm ready to have my mouth full of implants and I want to be able to chew again. Helen, at the point, uh, when, the, when she presented to the clinic, it was 90 years of age. 90 years old. Yes. So the reality of it is that, yes, I'm a clinician and, and I do this a lot, but also I have a sense of trying to not to take advantage of patients where they want something, right? Right. So I told Helen, Helen, please forgive me if I asked you this question, but why now? It's not that I cannot do it for you, you're still healthy, but why now? And she said, doctor, what I appreciate and what is important to me is to be able to chew again. Because I have been without teeth for many years that I don't know what it's like to chew it or the taste of food. And you know what, I've been saving all this time and when I go, well, someone else is gonna enjoy the products of my savings, but you know what, the, what's important to me is to every weekend I cook for my family. But I sit at the table with them and I cannot taste my food. I cannot eat it. Oh, wow. So for her, she told me either maybe I'm going to live another two years, five years, whatever many years as I'm going to live, I'm going to have the pleasure of tasting food again. So with her family, with her family. So that's a very touchy story I've about ready to. Yeah break down myself here yeah. just thinking of that it gives me the, the, chills, the, yeah. the chills but um what what it is with this story is that i at that point i was taught something and we always learn from patients but i was i learned that the quality of life for someone in her case was the being able to integrate herself to the family to be able to taste to be able for her that was important and she was willing to pay for that for that more chance in life to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Something that she lost that chance 20 years ago. So mm. I shouldn't discriminate patients when they come to me and as a clinician, not to discriminate against their thought process and try to insert my own agenda into mm. what I think is best for them, right? That's why I, I said before, you have to listen to the patient's concerns. Now, the beautiful thing is that Helen is still alive and she's still she enjoying, is. yeah, she's still enjoying her, her teeth and oh my she's goodness. Able to, uh, the function. So, so it's, it's, it's a very good thing, right? But ultimately it's a life changing event that you are able to help someone because of this procedure. And it uh, doesn't matter the age. Some patients come to me and they, the often thing that I, I, I hear is, doctor, I'm 70 years of age, I'm 75. I don't expect to live another five, 10 years, you know? Uh, I, I don't think it's worth it to spend this money. And I don't wanna, I'm not here to change their minds. Sure. But sometimes I share this story with them. Mm. And, and sometimes, you know, many of them say, you know what? I never thought about it. It's, 
it translates to quality of life for me. I probably should do it. Yeah. So it's just what you identify with. And yeah. if you think that procedure like this is going to be a life-changing event for you, do it. If you don't believe in it, even if you have all the money in the world, don't do it. Yeah. And that's a great point. And, and on the other side of the spectrum, on the other side of the age spectrum, again, I mentioned I'm 43. And I, I noticed when, when we were setting up in your clinic here, there was a, a young, attractive lady that was in here um, with one of your other associates getting a, a consultation for the All on X. And I, I guess I want to encourage, um, because there's very few things in this life that can bring about shame, like, a, like teeth, you know, it's just, right. there's not. And so um, <clears throat> don't be ashamed about this either way, whether you're 90 years old and you want to taste your family's food uh, or the food you cook for your family and enjoy laughing and that type of stuff, or you're 30 something years old and you suffered with periodontal disease, or, Correct. I mean, it's just one of those weird things that our society sometimes just has so much shame that can be with this. But like you said, and I, that's you, you said it better than I could have. And, and in that, um, it's, it's what your heart tells you. And don't wait. Don't wait because waiting, if we end up losing our teeth at a younger age, unfortunately, bone and mother nature do not help us along the journey and the bone will continue to be reduced in volume. So if we start at the earliest stages in our life and lose the teeth at early stages, by the time that we feel that we are ready to embark in this journey of the all on X, it might be too late. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be that requires a very heavy surgical interventions to reveal some of the bone that you've yeah. lost. So don't wait. If you unfortunately lost your teeth at early in, mm -hmm. in, in the early stages for X or Y reason, try to be proactive and consider this treatment because it is a good treatment. Yeah, it's a great treatment. I, uh, again, I know I started off saying thank you, but I really, I mean, I, you, you've taught me something in this interview and, and um, you know, uh, as you'll see in some of my other videos, I haven't been a fan of the dentist in my past because because of some of what our family has gone through and what I've personally gone through. But thank you for helping me um, uh, have a, a newfound respect for dentists. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. So, um, yeah, thank you. No, I thank really you very much, Matt. I appreciate that. And more than anything, I appreciate your interest and your effort of doing this pro bono yeah. because there's not a target of income doing right. this or what you're doing the right. interview and uh, driving your family around throughout the country. <laughs> I, I, I feel so bad that you're doing this, but yeah. it's your time, it's our time, and hopefully the audience get to also thank you as well as I do. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it, Dr. Aguayo. Thank you again.